Hello, Catherine. Hello, Madalena. Um, Hi, Anna. <laughs> Um, welcome to Mom Egg Review, a writer's and artist conversation with Catherine Vaz and Malena Pekitu. Um, we're very happy to have you here today talking about your connection and about your art. Um, so um, I'm going to introduce both people in some depth and then we can talk about your work. Let me, this is my first time doing this and so um, hopefully this is going to work out. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so um, I'm going to back up a little bit and say that Catherine is the first Portuguese American to have her work recorded by the Library of Congress, Hispanic Division, and she has taught writing the Luso experience for the past several summers in the Disquiet International Literary Conference in Lisboa, Portugal, where I was fortunate enough to have met her this summer. And we can see Catherine across from Madalena, um, about three down. Um, <laughs> this is a photo that makes me intensely jealous because I couldn't attend that lunch due to COVID. Um, Catherine's uh, other honors include an NEA fellowship, a citation as a Portuguese and American Woman of the Year, an appointment to the six-person presidential delegation, Clinton to the World's Fair Expo in Lisboa, and a 2022 citation by the Portuguese American Leadership Council of the U.S. as one of the all-time most influential women of Lusa heritage. She lives in New York City with her husband, Christopher Cerf, an Emmy and Grammy Award winning TV producer, composer for Sesame Street, editor and author. And um, Catherine is the author of three novels, Saudad, Mariana, published in six languages and picked by the Library of Congress as one of the top 30 international books of 1998 and is currently in script development with the Harrison Productions. Her newest novel, which we're talking about today, Above the Salt, published by Flatiron Books Macmillan, is also forthcoming in Russian. Her prize-winning short story collections are astounding, in my opinion, and include Fado and Other Stories, Our Lady of the Artichokes, and a special favorite of mine, which I bought multiple copies to gift, The Love Life of Assistant Animator and Other Stories. The first time I ever heard Catherine, uh, oh, and I wanted to share two blurbs um, that were my favorite. One is by um, Alexander Chi, and he said, the first time I ever heard Catherine Vaz read, uh, I, I remember thinking, who is this sorceress? As she made me cry in public with a short story in a way that's never been replicated. Uh, now we have a new novel from her and the magic has changed and expanded the, st the story's power, just a prelude for this new novel of love and exile. And I certainly agree with that, having read it myself. Um, we also have from Tayari Jones, Catherine Vaz, is the sort of artist who makes me wonder why the rest of us even bother. She evokes what the Portuguese call saudade, a beautiful, sumptuous longing. Singing sentences and pull you in plot let you know that Vaz is the real thing, an American treasure. Um, and moving on to um, Madalena Pequito. Um, she it was born, lives, and works in Lisboa. She studied scenography and costumes in art school, graduated for, uh, in painting at the Lisbon Faculty of Fine Art, completed a master's degree um, at St. Martin's in London, Central St. Martin's in London. Um, Quito participated in an exchange program in Budapest. She was awarded, importantly, with Flod's Prize, which fully funded her artist residency in New York, uh, which is relevant to our conversation here. Um, she is also part of the uh, Vesh Tresh, am I saying it right? Um, yes. Collective and has taken part in international biennials and more than 50 solo and group shows. Um, so I thought I'd start today uh, by uh, allowing you to talk about how you met. You wanna go first, Catherine? Sure, sure. I'll start off by saying it was such wonderful serendipity, something I believe happens in the world quite a lot when we're open to it. And I was in Manhattan, a dear friend named Patricia Duffy, who not incidentally has synesthesia and which if, if you don't know what that means is she 
she gets tested neurologically because she perceives things in color. She reads in color, words have color. And she heard I had never been to the Tenement Museum in New York City. And so we went, we had a lovely tour. And I like the fact that it's a monument to immigration uh, that we saw. And I said, oh, you know, I missed the opening for this. This Portuguese artist is in town, has a show. I heard about it, um, but I haven't attended. I missed the opening. It's going to close soon. Let's go. It was near that museum. So we wandered in and lo and behold, you know, I was just taken with, and so was my friend Pat, um, with the colorful, you know, wild, um, just sort of breezy. It, it felt like ocean. It felt like air. It felt like being in a color bath. And by total happenstance, uh, Madalena and a friend were there and we just started talking. So um, I really wanted to buy a piece and I believe in supporting other artists, particularly uh, Portuguese artists as a cultural exchange. I have been a beneficiary of Flod's uh, <clears throat> generosity myself. Um, so she had a piece called What's Next, which I had just finished this book that took me 15 years above the salt and What's Next resonated with me. And it was a picture of a young woman in New York's uh, subway car with an iguana on her hand or a lizard of some sort. And the, the car is flooding. And um, that just spoke to me as being so, so New York. And yet through the lens of somewhat of Portuguese heritage. So I just fell in love with it and I put it on my wall. So <laughs> the other thing that I quite loved about it, and then I'll pass this on to Madalena, is that apparently I thought that she was in a, a car that got flooded on the subway. It turned out that was not the case, but um, she did meet someone with a, an iguana on her hand. So I thought that even makes it better to me. But what's next is on my wall. And so it was a gift of just so, so much serendipity in a way to have met. Yes. Um, so Madalena, maybe I'll share the piece again, just so we can look at it. Um, and maybe we can transition into talking about um, your art and um, looking at um, whatever we really we want to talk about. Um, I happened to select pieces, including this one that figured, um, that had a figure of a woman in it. Um, I thought that was a nice overlap with, um, mom egg review and, um, some of what we try to highlight. Um, and to me, I have to say all of these, these works, uh, that you do, and I'm, I'm going to maybe move on to the next one as well is are um, are very compelling in that, there's so much serenity to me in the in the figures themselves, um, and then the way they intricately interact with their context and environments, uh, which you do with color and shape and line, um, is just very compelling. You know, I, I find myself wanting to look at every part of the painting and kind of, uh, but the the figure has so much depth and so much emotion. Um, and so she is always very compelling for me as well. Um, but the two together, you know, and the way they're they're interacting, I think seems characteristic of your work. Um, and so I just chose a few to look at um, and I can go back and forth, you know, anytime mm -hmm. you like, but um, if you just, if you wanted to say anything about, um, I don't know how you see your pieces, how do they make you feel or maybe what they, how they were inspired, whatever you like. Okay, sure. Um, so maybe I think we maybe we could go to the what's next again. Uh -huh. um, and I can just say that I really think it was serendipity because I wasn't supposed to go to the gallery that day. Mm -hmm. So I just want to do a little um, note on that. I wasn't going to go. My friend Monica, she's a ballerina. She also got Flads funding to study there and she was not going to go also. But then that day she texted me saying, I have some time. I'm going to go there now. And I managed to get some stuff done, went there, and then I saw Catherine. And I don't know, I just felt like chatting. 
felt like talking. We did, yeah. And that's what happened. Um, so it really wasn't, yeah. And I think that's really interesting how, like, in such a big city with so many things happening, and I feel like it kind of resonates with this piece because I also thought it was really interesting what Catherine said about how it seemed like some parts were real and some parts were not. And actually what really, really happened was the part that doesn't re doesn't seem real at all. Uh, the lady with the with the, the lizard, uh, it's a bearded dragon, so it's a r rare lizard. Mm -hmm. And the whole conversation she was having with me, um, that's the real part. But at the same time, um, everything else that I drew around it, uh, the fact that we are underwater, the fact that there's an explosion. If you look at the glass doors, um, it's like an explosion is happening uh, mm -hmm. below, like after the walls. And what's written in the, um, the signs is also something that basically was, that's what, what's on my, on my mind at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote there, are you down? What's next? Pick a side. Um, so I feel like my work can be uh, very political mm -hmm. at the same time, really introspective, introspective mm -hmm. because I feel like, uh, it's like a kind of a balance and I feel like in, in all the works this happens it's like a balance of what's outside and what's inside and how they resonate and how they connect and how um, whatever happens in the world maybe because I'm super sensitive and and I feel like things can get to me really easily um, and then all the exercise I do in my head about things that happened and this whole thing about what's next is also something that I feel a lot as a woman and as a painter, this feeling of having to prove yourself all the time, uh, especially as a, one, a young woman in, in Portugal, um, in this really uh, competitive art scene um, where you're fighting to be seen. And in this world that paints images of women that are super competitive and fighting against each other. Well, in, in fact, I don't think things are like that. I feel like we actually could collaborate. And that's why it's really important. You mentioned the collective Vistres. It's a collective of three women. And I'm always trying to fight for this idea that we can actually collaborate and create and be seen together and make up space for each other. Uh, but I feel like that's always on my mind. You know, how can I, what else can I do? What's the next step? How can I, how can I fight for this career a bit more? Because I really, this is really what I want to do. So um, yeah, I think, that's also also because well this is a comparison but really maybe unfair Catherine was writing that book for 15 years I was definitely not doing this show for 15 years because I'm 28 <laughs> um, but uh, after that show and having an invitation for a solo show in New York that seems like a dream to every Portuguese person yet somehow I feel in some moments I was some it was it's a, a weird feeling of like a bittersweet feeling of and now what? Uh, now you've done this, such a great opportunity. And now what you're gonna do with it? How you're gonna, I don't, you know, like what's next? What's gonna happen after this? The How pressure you, doesn't end. Uh, just jump in and add that our conversation when we met was so much about that, mm -hmm. that it was the idea, and I'm 40 years older than you are, but it is this feeling of how do I enjoy what, is now what does now mean if i'm always thinking what am i going to do next what yeah. and there's always the next thing to do so what's the value of what what does creation mean what does art mean what do what do we mean as people um uh if if we are always jumping ahead if we're always yeah. what the what's next <laughs> i mean how do we say what's now and you know, I think we all have heard like be in the moment thing, but that I've always thought moments aren't static. They're like water. How do you, it, it's like saying, how do you, you know, draw on water? Time moves constantly ahead. So how do we alter that with art? So we had, um, we didn't get that deep into it philosophically, but we did, I think, um, um, commiserate and connect about that aspect of, what does life mean if we're always competing or, or jumping ahead or, you know, how do we, what's now? So I think we had a now moment by yes, just- definitely. Yeah. It's, and it's only, it's always when you're not thinking about it. That's you know? right. That's right. So and when life surprises you, when yes. you're open to that surprise and yep. that's where uh, things feel a little more eternal or like 
this thing, it wasn't in my mind, it, but it was in my life. Yeah, definitely. Oh, that's a beautiful sentence. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it is a special thing, I think, when writers and artists connect, you know, and um, uh, that's something, you know, to to explore as well, perhaps in this conversation, you know, where you think um, your, your artwork also inter interacts or intersects. Um, so let me, um, uh, did you want to go to any of the other pieces to, to talk, talk about, about it like briefly, but uh, sure. the image has disappeared. So. Oh yes. I'm going to share again. I, I just felt, I wasn't sure if you were showing up, um, when you were talking and I sort of wanted to show. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, um, well, but yeah, I can talk about this briefly because of the idea of the woman. In mm. these cases, actually, it's me. In some works, I represent a, um, another woman. It doesn't have to be me. Um, I usually use images of to make the paintings. So because many of the times I'm alone in the studio, I use my, my image mm. as a reference. Mm. In some cases, I really want it to be me. In these two cases that I'm, you, you're seeing here, it's really about me. <laughs> um but in some other works i don't i try not to be very specific about who the person is mm -hmm. i just want to have a body there i just want to have a, a presence mm -hmm. and for some reason even if that's not about a woman's case or i don't know i just represent women because i feel like maybe that's what i'm more comfortable with um that's i don't know it's just the way i see the world or so it sometimes it's not something that i do rationally you know just i just do it like that but in these cases um, it's also about this idea of present and future and past. I'm always wondering about memory, about identity, um, about what's my role um, in the world, what's my part as a painter, what's my voice, how can I use my voice, and how can it be, I don't know, um, I don't have the answers. That's just what I'm wondering about, and these works all talk about that somehow, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course, women have been depicted in art forever, but it feels a little different when um, a female artist is depicting herself. You know, there's a there's a kind of an in interesting other thing that's happening there. And of course, here, is she a queen? Yeah. <laughs> yes. She's a queen. Um, yeah. I, I love that. Because, I love um, that. Thank you so much. I, I made this one after coming back from New York. Mm. And... I don't know this this is I think really really personal but mm -hmm. um, you know there's this tale of um, the princess uh, it's the pea the princess and the pea I don't know in Portuguese uh, yes I the know. princess and yeah. the pea you know yeah. yes mm -hmm. so you can see the pea under all the, the oh yes it's hidden there and then some some um, wallpaper, but you can see that it's hiding behind the wallpaper, some hands and some flowers are like some sort of like shadows trying to grab something. Oh, yes. uh, it's kind of hidden in there, mm -hmm. you know, in green, you can yes. see exactly there's a hand there. There are some um, shadows of furniture, plants, mm -hmm. uh, other objects that kind of mix with the wallpaper. Also yeah. to to make a question, and even I don't know what's real and what's not real. And that's a feeling I also have a lot. Like it's not, sometimes I feel like some memories I have, it's not, it's like, they're not even mine. It's like, was I really there? Did it really happen? And also maybe a little bit of an, an imposter, imposter syndrome sometimes, or again, this, oh, this constant questioning of, um, I don't know how to make a living out of painting <laughs> that's also something that's always on my mind I don't know I feel like sometimes it uh, all of this leads me to I don't know question myself a lot doubt myself a lot so sometimes I make these exercises to to I don't know question that too and to challenge that and I just call this one me queen <laughs> and yes. I can make an observation about this one which I just love um is is that the the women or the young women, whatever age in your paintings, seem to be own the painting or be part of the painting, whereas a lot of paintings, if you go to a museum, they seem like the women in them are being observed or gazed at. Mm -hmm. I think mean, that's a really striking difference to me. Um, and I think also just to pick up your comment, uh, I think having doubt in the question is is the fuel we work with rather than having an answer. Yep. 
Absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I love and that. And about the days. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Anna. No, no. I was just also going to make a similar um, reflection that, um, you know, I, I mentioned that I found so much serenity as a viewer um, by looking at these, these figures. So even though um, the fuel, as, as Catherine says, may, may be the doubt and the imagery might speak to some of that doubt and that questioning, um, there's something very grounding about seeing these women uh, figures at the center of these pieces or, you know, integrated into the work um, and something about, uh, you know, her expression, something about her, the way um, she holds her, her body, you know, there's a comfort there as well. So um, it's interesting. What were yeah. You um, well, about going back to Catherine's comment on the gaze thing, mm -hmm. it's because it's my gaze or maybe not even a gaze. It's just a story. And this person is a part of it. I don't want this image of a woman to be an excess, like ex excess. I feel like all yeah. paintings, usually a lot of male painters would use the beautiful image of the woman. And I don't, and even, I know I have a lot of, I know a lot of artists that still do that and represent women's bodies in a way that at least don't represent myself. I don't feel represented. I don't feel seen. I don't feel heard. And um, so I, I, I'm not really worried about the body itself or how it looks like. It's more about um, what the person is doing. How is that person feeling? So in, in this idea, when you said, uh, and then now going back to what you said, Anna, the, the fact that they're grounded and calm, it's like a feeling of despite having all of these in my mind and this, all of this maybe confusion and self-doubt and everything that's happening around, uh, the doubt between, is it real, is it not real? Um, there is this sort of feeling of accepting that maybe all of this um, questioning and all of this sensitivity is really important for my practice. And somehow I'm willing to accept that. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, I could keep looking at your images all day, um, Madeline, <laughs> and people should go to um, Instagram. Instagram is a great place to find you. I'm just going to go back to, um, let me see if I can go back to your, uh, your Instagram name so people can look you up um, more easily there. And she, and she also has a website as well. So i um, very excited to see more of your, your work. And uh, we're going to go now to um, highlighting um, above the salt. And um, Catherine, I believe is going to read uh, just the very first page of her new novel, which just came out this, this fall, right? It came out November, uh, 2023. So it's fairly new. Um, it had a big surge at the beginning because it was the book of the week from People magazine mm -hmm. and got on a lot of those lists. It's the story very briefly of uh, based on the true story of a group of people in Madeira, uh, the Portuguese island of Madeira, who were converted to Presbyterianism, violently driven off the island and and as it's incredible as it sounds, adopted by Illinois at the time of Lincoln. And I followed the trail of a real person who grew up in jail with his mother, mm -hmm. um, who was you know, condemned to die for heresy. And he joined the Union Army um, and he courted a woman uh, in the Lincoln household. And then he wandered the West for 50 years till he found her again. So um, I wandered through this book for 15 years. That's how long it took me. but. A very brief story before I read the first page is my branch of the family in the Azores um, were very poor and very hungry and and they were called Ushpasaringush, like the little birds, because when they were hungry, their mother said they should sing, like to eat their music, to distract themselves. Um, and also it was a signal to the neighbors to bring them food. But this is a way of incorporating my family history with the true history in the United States of an immigration story that is not very well known. And I would describe this as, you know, the sweeping love story, uh, but also a story of immigration, story of uh, the Civil War as well. And there are very few books from the point of view of immigrants who were in the Civil War.
So I will read just the first page. Um, for a long time, when he lived in jail with his mother, he ate nothing but the music of birds. Serafina Alge was a 35-year-old widow on the Portuguese island of Madeira, condemned to die for heresy, for chatting like friends with the Presbyterian God. John, screeching, had gripped her skirts when the soldiers seized her, and they decided to use him to break her. If she did not return to the communion of her youth, she and her son would starve to death. The jail was in their village outside the capital city, and John stayed barnacled to her middle. Their cell dizzied him with its scent of lime and salt. Hungry, asked Tonio Dutra, the guard, accept the true faith, Senora Alves. John lunged for the key dangling from Tonio's belt, but only smashed his face against the bars. Tonio pivoted away laughing and devouring a mango. We'll eat some songs, John, she whispered. Music would feed them. They would feast upon sounds. Seabirds squawked and chattered close by and their melodies tasted sweet. Mother said that John and she were birds themselves. He was a hawk with talons. She was a rock dove. And at first they both dined very nicely on quite the little orchestra of their fellow birds. My boy has blue wings, sang mother. I fear no evil. My love is a sword. And that's the first page. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I have to say when I was reading my copy of this book, um, I was tagging all the lines that I thought were really beautiful because I thought, I'm not going to do it this time, but I, you know, I was thinking, oh, I'll read, you know, from the book, my favorite lines. And I had so much, so many tags, and so <laughs> many um, pages that I just had to take them all out because it was just pretty much on every. Thank you. That's the nicest thing. You <laughs> and, I mean, yeah, I guess the only thing even nicer would be say, I, I hope I made you cry at least once. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I was completely okay, afraid. Right. I was completely riveted on so many levels, you know, the, the history, you know, I, I do like historical fiction, but a lot of times when I read it, I feel like, um, you know, it's too much in service of the, the history, like, you know, it's, it's sort of like a vehicle for the history. I feel like this is a, a literary work, you know, a poetic work that includes in it is grounded in history, but is a piece of literature, you know, and really so much poetry and, on pretty much any page, you can find um, a line that will just make you slow down a little bit. So I, my experience of reading this novel was actually that um, it slowed me down. I'm usually a very fast reader, um, but I, you reminded me to just enjoy, you know, enjoy the language. I, and, I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I can, I can add that one of the most thrilling. Um, aspects of finishing the book have been many letters, many, many comments from people saying, you know, it's poetic. It's, a, you know, it's a beautiful book. It's um, the language is wonderful, but also the plot was so unexpected and it took twists and turns I didn't anticipate. And I loved the characters and I worked so, so hard on that. Um, so it was really gratifying to get those kind of comments. I will just add one thing that that um, since this is a bicultural conversation we're having is that it has come out in Portuguese as well. And I did a, quite a bit of publicity for that. And my proudest moment was to be on the front page of Diário de Notícias, which is the main news newspaper mm -hmm. during the Euro Cup. So Cristiano Ronaldo and I are on the front cover and he seems to be staring right at me. So that <laughs> was a highlight of my whole career. So, um, yeah, so, but, but um, thank you. I did want to throw in one other thing, which yeah. is that Anna also, I just want to say to your listeners, Anna um, unfortunately was ill for a while during our workshop at Disquiet this summer. And she made these gorgeous, handmade artistic bookmarks for all her colleagues so i love I the you so much <laughs> yeah i love the idea of that writers can think about fine arts and fine arts you know can use language and 
you know, I, I, it's not an accident that my painting of Madalena's has words on it. Mm. Uh, so I love that combination, but I also wanted to point out that and Anna also has her um, <laughs> artistic as in painting talent. That's so sweet. I am, um, I am somebody who mixes up often the words poem and painting. I think they're very similar, you know, very similar. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Um, Catherine, I just want to say I'm waiting for your book. Mm. It's still, I, I, I've ordered it in Portuguese. I've ordered it in Portuguese. I, I was, I don't know. I was question. I was wondering because I can speak English, but mm. at the same time, when I'm reading, I feel like that's when I feel the biggest difference. Even though, yeah, yeah. it's like reading something. Um, when I'm reading reading in Portuguese, I can imagine voices in my head better. Yes, that makes perfect sense. You visual, well, you're visualizing words. It's like words I can, are- Yeah, so I can uh, imagine something more if it's mm -hmm. in Portuguese. So I was like, really, it was a puzzling thing because I wanted to to read it in like in your own voice, mm -hmm. but- Well, Tanya Ganyo, who is the translator I, I, and has turned into a really good friend as well, is really talented. And we had a fun- um, sessions sitting in her apartment in Lisbon going over certain phrases that there are always phrases that don't translate yes right. and I yes. had one that stuck in my mind that I'll share is we say sprays to indicate like sprays of gladioli like uh, flowers and okay. she said we don't really have that <laughs> we don't have a word I don't know what to say and so we laughed about that and and you know it was wonderful talking uh, back and forth about that mm -hmm. But thank you for buying it, Portuguese. Oh no, I really, I was really curious, and I, I was just wondering whether to do it in Portuguese or in English. I hope I don't regret it to do it in Portuguese. Yeah, I should, I should read it in Portuguese and and enjoy it. But I'm at this point, I think I've read it so many times that I have to wait. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to uh, maybe just say. Um, goodbye right now. Um, and, but thank you so much for having this conversation for actually the one of the first um, uh, conversations, writers and artists on Mer, uh, Mom Ang Review. Um, so I'm going to end the recording for now, but thank you so much for um, having this conversation. It's been wonderful. Thank Thanks you so much, much Anna, for thank coordinating you. it all. And, and it's so good to see you and Madalena. It's great to see you too. Thank you so much for this conversation. Take care. Bye-bye.